Good morning, everyone. I am Dante Ang, the President and CEO of the Manila Times. Uh, we're privileged today to have as our guest, Congresswoman Stella Kimbo of the Second District of Marikina. Good morning, Kong Stella, if I may Good call morning. you that. Yes, actually, they call me Teacher Stella. So. Teacher Stella. Yeah. Okay, well, we've been, we've been very interested in, in inviting you to talk to us, not only because of your recent um, uh, initiatives in, in the House, uh, particularly uh, by any entry, but um, we're, we're also quite interested in, in um, your views as an economist. I, you know, I understand that before uh, joining government, for a long time you were with the University of the Philippines uh, School of Economics. Uh, I remember you as being president of the Philippine Economic Society also. Um, so maybe um, let, let's start there. Maybe if you can first wear your hat as an economist, give, a, give us a view because um, Manila Times um, had a couple of events already this year. The first event we had um, an economic briefing with the central bank governor and the DOF secretary. And of course they were very rosy in their forecast. And then we had uh, more recently another event where we invited um, uh, the um, uh, uh, prophet of boom, see <laughs> Bernie Villegas of, of UAP. And he was uh, uncharacteristically uh, less optimistic. He was saying that, you know, um, it was unlikely for the government to reach its, its GDP growth target this year. In fact, 4% was perhaps more realistic. And that was before the lockdown. And I think a week after we went on, on, on uh, that uh, new ECQ. But what, what, is your, what is your view? First, as an economist of what's going on um, and um, maybe your critique on the government response. Well, okay, so as an economist, um, it is what it is. Let's look at the numbers. <laughs> um, the GDP contraction uh, was 9.5%. Uh, mm. So uh, way bigger than what economic managers thought it would be for the whole year. They thought it would be somewhere between 5 and 5.5, five and I think. Inflation um, has also become a problem, um, primarily because of food inflation. And um, the, the second source of inflation, which... Um, I don't see a lot of stories about is transportation. So transportation mm. is also contributing a lot to um, the overall uh, inflation. Well, it is what it is. If you look at the numbers, uh, we've had uh, a GDP contraction of 9.5% for the entire 2020. Um, that's the biggest, I think, since uh, the World War. And then um, secondly, we also have uh, uh, an inflation problem. Um, particularly because of food inflation. And as we know, so the, the food sector, particularly livestock, um, not only did they experience, of course, a pandemic, but there's also ASF as well as um, a series of typhoons. So because the supply was disrupted, then um, that uh, pushed prices up. So in addition to output contraction, you have a situation of uh, inflation. And those are two uh, two very important concerns as far as uh, the economy is concerned. So that's where we are right now. So if people like Dr. Villegas tend to be somewhat um, uncharact uncharacteristically pessimistic, that's probably where he's coming from. So that's also the reason for why Speaker Velasco filed a biennium three. That was the trigger. Eh? Now, when, when the Philippine Statistics Authority um, announced the, the inflation, um, as of January 2021, 20, and uh, noted that uh, the biggest source was food. And then uh, also, no, another source of inflation is, is transportation. Mas na pag-uusapan ng food inflation, but really right. uh, what also contributes um, is transportation inflation. So, so that was the trigger. So uh, um, Speaker Velasco and, and I filed... Uh, a biennium three stimulus, uh, it's an economic stimulus package amounting to about 420 billion pesos. And uh, the biggest item there is re really the ayuda for all. It's a um, thousand pesos per Filipino. So uh, there's an appropriation of 108 billion pesos for that purpose. So right. why is it ayuda for all? If you remember biennium one, the biggest problem there was, was that um, there was a, a problem with the list of beneficiaries. The targeting. So there was no list. 
no? Wala tayong national ID system, uh, wala tayong listahan ng uh, sino yung most affected. And so if if it boils down if you roll out a program that's based on a list and that list is limited, napopolitik ka yan eh, right? Because who who ends up in the list now depends on uh, who the LGUs would put or or uh, which names the DSWD would include. So that became a problem. And so speaker said, let's fix this by making it inclusive. So that's really the reason for why I do the for all yung, uh, yung naging panawagan ni speaker. So uh, anyway, so it's it's ayuda for individual. Uh, it's in, really ayuda for families, but it's also ayuda for workers and not only workers who lost their jobs, because that's that's pretty obvious. Now you need to help those that got displaced as a result of the pandemic, but also um, subsidies for those that are currently employed, especially by MSMEs. So the idea there is um, small businesses are, are cash strapped, right? So you need to support them, and uh, a, a good way to support them is to defray some of their payroll costs. Right. So there's a big chunk there that's also intended for wage subsidies. Okay. And uh, yes, and uh, there's also assistance for teachers and students, and of course um, some funds for vaccines. So that's sort of the gist of Bayani right. and Three. Uh, and again, inclusive inclusivity was important. Number two, uh, implementation was also a major consideration. So right. ang tinanong ni speaker. Ano ba sa mga programs ang nagkaroon na ng, ang may proof of life na and right. nagkaroon naman ng relative success under right. Bayanihan 1 and Bayanihan 2. And so that was why we chose um, the small business wage subsidy program that was uh, implemented by both the DOF and SSS. So that was actually relatively successful. Of course, there were problems at the beginning, but then pretty much it got rolled out, um, I think, quickly. I think in a matter of two months, they were able to disperse as much as 52 billion. Okay. Right. And two, of course, SAP, SAP, which is the Ayuda, uh, was a problem at the beginning, but somehow um, we were able to, to, to fix the, the, the system. So we said, okay, I think that's something that's um, we can reasonably say that uh, is working, um, uh, although imperfect, but can still be improved upon. And then third is TUPAD. TUPAD is the Emergency Employment Program of DOLE. And, uh, and IAX, IAX is Assistance for Individuals in Crisis Situations, which is, in fact, the platform for the SAP program of under the Bayanian one. So anyway, so those were mm -hmm. the two considerations, um, inclusivity and um, the ability to implement quickly. Right. Okay, so where are we today? Where are we today? Um, unfortunately, as you know, it's really, the, it's really Congress who's pushing it, right? and we're the ones who are really so... Um, uh, Gung-ho about this, you know, we're right. really more pushy, right? Uh, yeah. With respect to economic stimulus. Um, the, I think among the senators recently, it was um, Senator Pacquiao who, who filed um, a 335 billion peso economic stimulus package. And I think December of last year, if I'm not mistaken, Senator Recto filed um, my November by an EN3 version. So, okay. But then there's not a lot really. Uh, but of course, um, the biggest um, obstacle at this point is really um, getting to convince, of course, our economic managers. Right. So it's that's where we are at this point. Um, Speaker Velasco and his team, which of, of course includes myself, um, we've been working closely with the economic managers uh, to to try to source funds, no? I think that's maybe that's the biggest um, problem, biggest concern of the economic managers. It's not really whether we need it or not. Uh, I think what they're always worried about is whether we can afford it. And so right. we keep telling them that, you know, a potential source of funds, for example, is uh, perhaps a BSP loan. Under uh, Bayan there's this provision there that allows BSP to lend. I think parang 20% more. Okay. So that boils down to about 282 billion pesos uh, additional funds. So that's a possibility. And so we said, you know, why don't we 
borrow half of what's available with the BSP, so 141 billion. So those are just examples of um, suggestions coming from Congress on where funds can be sourced. Of course, um, the more obvious, uh, the more obvious uh, source would be savings. But of course, in savings, because we don't have visibility on it's really right. for them to let us know um, which of those savings would be available. And so that's why we've been coordinating uh, closely. Uh, so the question is where to source the funds. So number two, uh, magkano ba talaga ang uh, ang magiging available for for a buy and entry? So right. as to which items will be funded, tingin ko ano na lang yun eh, parang obvious na naman eh, kung ano yung mga importante. For example, ayuda, especially now that we are under an enhanced ECQ for the technically third time. Yeah. You know? Kasi yeah. nag one tayo and we had another and then we had an extension. So it's very obvious that every time you do an ECQ, you really need to do ayuda. The only way that people can stay at home and uh, can comply with that stay-at-home order is for those, especially no work, no pay workers, you have to assure them that their basic needs would be, um, would be uh, provided for, right? So that's the reason for why each time we do an ECQ, there really has to come ayuda with it. Otherwise, wow. compliance is, is really going to be less than perfect. Yeah, what, what, what what's, makes me curious is, is your advocacy of this thing because it, it seems to make more sense now that we are again in ECQ and you know we're are into our second week now um, and hopefully it won't, it won't be extended. But I, I noticed that even before Cases were rising up to the 8,000 level, and and then you know, the, of course, that that gave the the pressure to impose ECQ. You you were already pushing the Bayani and three. So what what were you seeing b before then? You know, early in February already, you're and, and even earlier, I, I believe you you were already advocating for Bayani and three. What were you seeing as as the economic need for 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 that for that bill? So you're right, Clint. No? Even before um, this latest surge in cases, um, I had already been passionate about it. And where I was coming from was really economic recovery. You're, you're, um, I was really coming you're like from, the only one talking really about it. From, <laughs> yes, I was really coming from that biggest GDP contraction. I was also coming from supply side disruptions um, in yeah, right. the agriculture sector. And so we said, I said, you know, the way to, to get out of this rut is for government to spend more. Right. If you look at the biggest um, source of, or the biggest driver of GDP contraction, it's, it's really consumption, consumption spending. Right. I think 70% right. of that is due to um, right. the drop in consumption. consumption. So, okay, what do you do? So you have to give assistance to households so they can spend more, right? So that's, right. that's right. a simplistic, uh, that's a simple but actually logical way to go, right? right. Uh, kailangan I, mong magpadami I, I, ng, ng pera na umiikot sa ekonomiya, right? right? So now, walang panggastos ang pamilya, bigyan mo muna ng panggastos. Okay, however, the question is, is that approach sustainable? Hmm. No. Cannot be su sustainable. We cannot live on ayuda forever. So, right. um, the flip side of it is you have to help the MSMEs. The MSMEs employ 63% of the workers. MSMEs are about 96% of all establishments. So you need to, to, to prop them up. You have to make sure that our MSMEs don't die because they will, they will continue uh, employing people. And at the same time, they will have value added to the economy. So it's really two parts. And so we said, you give ayuda to families so they can spend more. And at the same time, you give ayuda to MSMEs so they get back up on their feet. Right. And at the same time, um, there's, a, there's a portion in, uh, in our bill that is for capacity building for MSMEs. So they should be helped, right? Meaning, um, do they need livelihood kits? Do they need help as they migrate to an online platform? So... Th these are not automatic to MSMEs, right? Um, because it costs right. a lot. Uh, right. Just a side story. I, I was a shoemaker. I had a small okay. shoe business. 
um, until of course I had to close it down because of, of the pandemic. Um, so at one point when, when it was very expensive for me to go on selling in Greenbelt 5, that was where I, I, I started, um, oh. I decided to shift to online. It cost me a lot of money. I mean, just for the website right. alone, I spent more than yeah. 100 grand, right? And I was not satisfied. I had to keep improving it and spent more. So you cannot expect an MSME to just automatically shift online because now yeah. the only way to survive for many um, economic sectors is to do it online or is to at least have an online um, component of your business. So so there. Yeah. Um, so that are, that's where we were coming from. And then all of a sudden, surge happened. Right. Now, um, 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 when surge happened, I don't know why, but um, the framing became pumili ka, buhay ba, or kabuhayan? Yeah, but isn't that, isn't that a false choice? I mean, we, we understand, right, that, that you know, the, the science tells us that we have to take precautions. But at the same time, there is the economic survival in the balance. Is that a false choice or is there a way to, you know, move forward safely? What, what, what's, your, what's your view? <clears throat> well, okay. Is there a trade-off trade or not? I, yeah. I guess that's a question. So right. if you think about it, in the strictest sense, okay, so if you open up your economy, clearly there could be a possibility of increased cases, right? Because people go right. out. So then right. infection, <clears throat> the probability of an infection is higher. It's, higher. It's, right. it's common sense, right? But but at the same time, if you if you choose health, naman, if you say, okay, let's be strict about lockdowns, nobody leaves the house, let's close down the economy, what happens naman? In the context of the Philippine economy, many of our workers are no work, no pay nga. Diba? Right. If you say stay at home, kung hindi sila mamamatay sa COVID, mamamatay sila sa gutom. Right. Right? Right. And so, of course, with gutom comes many development problems, right? Meaning illnesses, not necessarily covid not only that, long-term implications yan. Kung nagutom ka right. today, may implication yan sa school school performance ng mga bata. Yeah, right? It can be generational, yeah. yeah. So, and so poverty, as we all know, is an intergenerational problem. Like Once you fall into poverty as a result of hunger, it's it takes generations for you to get out of it. All right? So may ganon. So what I'm saying is don't make us choose between health and wealth because we need both. And so, right. and that's the reason for why I said recently, alam nyo, kalokohan tong ECQ eh. Yung ECQ kasi is a malawakan stay-at-home right. policy. Right. Everyone, right. if you right. happen to live in a street with zero cases, right. and you work in the next street also with zero cases, you're supposed to stay at home. That's what ECQ right. means, right? So what I'm saying is, why don't we do a household lockdown instead? What can I Malawakan ECQ? You only have a stay-at-home policy for affected households. So meaning right. to say, household of 10 members, one got um, RT-PCR tested positive. Kung walang um, ability to have isolation in that house, so we ask this um, COVID patient to move to an isolation facility no? para hindi niya mahawaan yung members. Meanwhile, the nine members, for now, while we're waiting for the test results, mag-quarantine na. Huwag na kayo okay. lumabas ng bahay. Let's right. now presume na muna that you're possibly infectious. So stay at home ka na rin. So let in short, that's what we mean by let's lock down this affected household. Okay, meanwhile... How do you tell them that it's okay if you stay at home? You have to give ayuda. You have to say, okay, guys, okay. stay at home. Rest assured, we will provide you your basic needs. The barangay will come and provide you with um, the necessary health care. Of course, you'll need to be tested. Um, uh, a, a professional, a healthcare worker will have to take your temperature, etc., etc. And at the same time, here's some food or cash assistance. Para lang we're sure that um, your basic needs are provided for. So yun yung nakikita kong alternative. If you have something like this, you don't have to choose between health and the economy because if you only close down affected households, the economy will still keep moving. Hindi mo kailangan magsara ng non-essential businesses. Remember, yung pagsara ng non-essential businesses, yun yung yumari sa atin. 
That's yeah. the reason for why um, last year, talagang ang laki ng ating GDP contraction. Okay. So, I want to ask... Saying, there's, there is a trade-off in a strictest sense, as I right. had explained, but there's a way to there's balance. There's a way around it. Yeah. Yes, there's a way to, to have both. You know? Right. I, I want to ask about, you know, something in hindsight, and they, and they say hindsight is always 2020, but there were, there were several months between the initial surge last March and of course this what we're what we're seeing now the, where cases were more manageable um, in hindsight and i suppose it's not completely useless because this can be a lesson also for the future do you think more could have been done uh, in terms of um, hospital bed capacity uh, in terms of maybe um, uh, testing uh, contact tracing. I noticed that one of the bills you filed in the past uh, had had to do with a hospital in Bicol increasing their 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 bed capacity almost double, I believe. But I think one of the problems were that that, that triggered this lockdown was the hospitals were also being overwhelmed. But that begs the question: What was done in the previous months, you know, to anticipate to anticipate the surge? What what's your view on that? Well, absolutely. I think um, there are many things that we <laughs> failed to do in the past. But, but again, we can't be blaming people. We can't be like pointing fingers. Yeah, sure. I mean, COVID is really novel, right? I mean, we, we hardly know anything about it. It's mysterious, right? Um, so, and we're always smarter in hindsight. <laughs> but then, okay, so in hindsight, there are things that, and it's, it's, it's really important to, to, to look in the past because this is a continuing saga, right? So there's still a chance for us to correct um, whatever mistakes we had in the past. Okay, so first, I think we were not, and we continue not to be completely honest in assessing the situation. I think that's the first. Um, we are poor in uh, uh, record keeping. We don't know exactly how many COVID cases we have. Right now, um, the, the COVID cases that are reported to us every day by DOH, that's based on those that tested positive uh, okay, in yeah. PCR tests. But Clink, RTPs yeah. are very expensive. Yeah. They're at least 4,000 pesos. I had one recently that was almost 10,000 pesos. Wow. We expect our kababayans to, to be able to afford that. So in my example sure, earlier, yeah. in a household of 10, but kung maswerte yung isa na nakapagpa-RT-PCR, you cannot expect the nine members to also have an RT-PCR. It's just terribly expensive, right? So so that's one. No, um, There had, ako on hindsight, tapat there's a parallel system of um, record keeping. And the way to do it is make it LGU-based. Because honestly, the LGUs know how many cases there are. Ako, I talk to my captains more than looking at the numbers. The captains know how many the um, COVID positives are because they monitor. And honestly, uh, we were affected by COVID. My husband had COVID, so we had a scare. Oh. I don't wish it upon anyone. It was the most frightening moments of our lives. Kung nagka-COVID ang family mo, kahit sino ka pa mayaman mahirap, you will reach out to someone. Malalaman din eh. Malalaman niya ng LGUs. Because talagang yes. you will need help. You will need help talaga. So, so, so wait, do you, do you think the numbers are overstated or understated? So and what's the, real num what's the real number that you're hearing from the ground? They're very understated. I used to... Understated. Um, I used to like estimate um, under detection. Okay. Uh, I... I I'm actually writing a paper now, um, but I have yet to check the numbers. I don't want to reveal it yet, but um, I'm working on a paper now that, that uh, oh, by, by the way, I'm a health economist. No, I'm a health right, economist. Right. So uh, I continue to write papers. I'm working on a paper now that um, uh, that tries to estimate um, the extent of under underreporting. So, but anyway, um, I, I it's it's big. I, I don't want uh, to alarm but people. Nice, but uh, early on, there were times when I think it could be as high as 25% or 30%. But again, wow. I don't quote my numbers first because those are very um, tentative. I have to look at it. But anyway, um, severely underreported numbers. So which means, just like a doctor, if you fail to diagnose um, a problem or an illness properly, 
eh, kulang din yung treatment mo. Right? So, I think that's step one eh. Let's be honest. Ano ba talaga? Magpakatotoo na tayo. Ilan ba talaga ang cases? Saan ba talaga yung pinakamalala? And therefore, we should target our resources there. Right? So, I think that's number one. And, and a related um, outcome, if you don't have proper reporting, is you have difficulty tracing. Kasi hindi mo nare-record silang lahat. Paano mo matitrace? Right? Okay. So, so, dead ka na sa reporting tangay na si tracing, right? right? Okay. Testing. Testing early on, DOH was very... Um, in fact, up to today, they, they stand by their position that only the symptomatics get tested. Hmm. So, it's a problem because we know that um, a lot of the cases... They are symptomatic, are yeah. symptomatic, right? Which means if you want free testing uh, from the DOH, from the government, you have to be symptomatic. So, paano yun, right? Paano kung asymptomatic ka? At paano kung yeah. asymptomatic pala yung silent spreaders? Right? So, again, parang, ano eh, we failed to to scale up testing up to today. Right? So, walang ano eh, walang corrective um, mechanisms. Why? I guess it's also because um, it goes down again to being honest with the, with the assessment of the situation. Right. Um, yeah. when, when, when they say, um, no, we're data-based, yeah, but are you using all the data uh, right. that, that can be generated? So right now, um, what is being generated na data is yun na nga, from the RT-PCR tests. But other data can be generated. For example, what about those that use antigen tests? Right? Um, how are those monitored? And I, don't think I know are. a lot of cases uh, where uh, they were diagnosed using an antigen. Uh, I mean, they were screened, not diagnosed. They were screened right. using an antigen test. When they tested positive, hindi na sila nagpa-confirm. They just right. presumed that they were COVID positive because they exhibited symptoms anyway. So, right. so, yun eh. so I think um, we really have to take to heart uh, at, when we say we want it data-based and we want it based on science. We really have to take that to heart. Okay, and number two, hospital bed capacity. Um, again, if if we had the proper reporting of numbers, then we would know na magiging problema yung kakulangan ng hospital beds. Malalaman natin yung katotohanan, di ba? Um, so now naman na naabutan tayo ng scarcity uh, of beds, the question is, how do we move forward? Eh parang... As of the last hearing, I can't remember when was this. I think two Fridays ago or last Friday, last week, we had the 10-hour hearing. Um, and so I asked Secretary Duque, uh, what's the plan? No, It's very clear that there are many places like my my, my district, um, mm -hmm. hospital beds available. What's the plan? Um, unfortunately, walang concrete plan. No, He just said, okay, I submit that um, numbers are underreported uh, because you know, we don't capture everything. Um, but then moving forward, uh, we have to study this some more and we, we have to figure out ways how to expand bed capacity. So in short, um, naabutan na sila ng problema, right? right? Instead of being proactive, uh, we're always nagahabol. The virus is faster than our response. So for example, at that point in time, I said, what about home care? Uh, ako, okay. iniisip ko na eh, ano yung fallback ko kung magkasakit kami uh, ng family ko, di ba? What do we do? Uh, will I actually consider home care? And at that point, there was no policy stance yet on home care. Kasi ako, from a consumer perspective, uh, kung may magsabi sa akin, ito, mag-home care ka na lang kung wala kang makuha hospital bed. Siyempre, isipin ko, teka muna, allowed ba yan? I don't know these people. Uh, will I be able to get field health uh, reimbursement if I uh, do home care? Things like those. And those policy things have to come from DOH, right? So, walang, wala pang policy stance on home care. I think up to today, baka wala pa yata. Number two, makeshift hospitals. Um, I asked them if they already were starting to build makeshift hospitals. Parang they were just about to start pa lang. Um, and then I said, what about... Um, Malemo, there are existing beds in some private companies. And buti na lang, a few days later, 
uh, there was a suggestion na why don't we use hotels, right? So, so yun, parang right, right. what's the bottom line? I think there's a little bit of um, lack of being proactive. No? Uh, alam naman natin eh, diba, na, na magiging ganito given the surge. Magkakaproblema ka sa hospital beds. Dapat, you know, you try to to anticipate no? What, what's going to be the, but, but, the requirement. You know, you've been studying well, public health for a long time. And isn't it fair to say that you know, this has been a, a long time problem with the Philippines, the, the public health infrastructure. Um, I've heard for many decades about uh, the, the lack of um, hospital capacity per capita. Maybe the, the doctor to patient ratio is you know, far less ideal than, than, than in many countries. Um, and then all of a sudden, of course, we, we, we were struggling with COVID and, and un- unanticipated it. And then that exacerbated the thing. But in, in terms of policy and, you know, again, trying to be constructive, what, what could be the policy beyond COVID? I mean, because with or without COVID, we had this problem already with not having enough healthcare facilities, not, not enough hospitals in the country. Um, what are the policy prescriptions there? So you're right, COVID really um, all of these uh, inherent uh, weaknesses of the healthcare system. No? And there's a lot of them. Um, it's, uh, first of all, no? first of all, if you ask a group of Filipinos, sino sa inyo dito may doctor, may sariling doctor? And I mm. always do this when I go around my district. You know, maybe three less than five people will raise their hands. No, so I'm talking about um, communities. Very few people, especially among the lower income classes, would have their own doctors. And that to me is very alarming, right? And that's what the universal healthcare law seeks to do. So one of the two main provisions of the universal healthcare law is precisely to ensure that every Filipino will have his own uh, doctor or at least primary care provider, okay? But it has, I think that law was passed in 2019, so it's 2021. Um, Recently. That has not been rolled out. And of course, um, if you ask them, I, I don't even want to ask them why not because clearly <laughs> we have to deal with COVID first, right? Right. But, but even... Before COVID, like uh, 20, the whole of 2019, right? Uh, why didn't they start implementing it? Wala talaga. So, hindi pa na roll out. Um, hindi pa yan, na, um, hindi pa na yata yan na launch yung uh, uh, the plan to to give every Filipino his or her own doctor. So, that's for me a clear indicator of um, that uh, it, it's very lacking, no? Our, our healthcare sector. Wala pa ako sa beds, ha? Sa ano pa lang? Uh, right. Doctor pa lang, right? right. Um, and again, um, this, the, the word that is always used by scholars and in fact even policymakers are increasingly using this term to describe the sector is it's highly fragmented. It's mm. highly fragmented. Meaning um, the, the units, the, the many actors, they're not coordinated. Right. right? If you talk to if you talk to Phil Health, for example, right? you talk to Phil Health, uh, ask them, what, what's your plan for 2021? You look at their actuarial projections. So they have a plan to have a primary care um, package, for example, um, for every Filipino, and it's going to cost um, $65 billion. So a primary care package is uh, has checkups, all right? Checkups for every Filipino. And they say it's going to cost $65 billion pesos. Okay, so a big chunk. Um, but if you ask them, uh, would you have enough doctors to mm. actually implement this? Hindi nila alam. So that's a clear that's a clear example of failure to coordinate, right? Meaning, bakit ka may plano ng ganyan, you're going to finance it when you're not talking to DOH and DOH is supposed to ensure that um, the doctors are there, right? So, so that you know, um, the financing units in a, in in our system don't talk to the 
providers, right? So PhilHealth and DOH, and daming examples where they don't seem to be talking to each other. Right, and right. that's one. Um, number two is between local and central. Because as you know, health is devolved. No? So ibig sabihin, right. um, now it's really the LGUs that manage uh, right. hospitals, etc. Unless you are retained by uh, DOH. So the general rule is you're now the uh, healthcare facilities are managed by the LGUs, uh, meaning they finance and manage, operate uh, the health facilities. Unless you are retained, no. So examples of retained hospitals would be health center, right? Uh, heart center and KTI, right. etc. Yes. Yeah. So if you look again, um, pakikita mo na there's a problem. There's a parang disconnected. No, there's no nexus between the local and the central. Eh, dito na lang sa COVID management, de ba? Um, parang makikita mo eh, that uh, there seems to be problems because for example the barangay health workers um they are under the lgus uh, right. but they are not fully utilized for purposes of covid control when in fact um they are a very i think a very um productive resource because our barangay health workers of course i can say this now because they are they have now been vaccinated um dati kasi parang hirap magsabi na um let's deploy yeah. all our barangay health workers when of course, ang takot ko rin is baka sila magkasakit din, di ba? Right. Um, right. So now that there's more sufficient resources to protect them, at least dapat um, mas fully ma-utilize sila. But I don't see that eh. There's no, um, at least from my perspective, I don't really see that. Even in our district, I don't see that our BHWs are fully deployed, right? Uh, so because also they're not, fully compensated. Many of them just right. receive allowances. Yeah. A very measly amount. Um, I think 500 pesos for... I, I've heard less in some, some LGUs. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, yun eh, di ba? So, again, another example of uh, where there is um, a failure of coordination. Yeah. So, so, it's really fragmented. So, um, you really need to overhaul the system. Right. Uh, so it's it's not just um, infusing um, a lot of cash, etc. You have to make sure that whatever you infuse can be absorbed. You know, meaning meaning you streamline first the system, uh, and then at the same time, um, that would ensure better absorptive capacity of resources. So I think right. these are the two things. You need to do the structural changes, um, streamlining all of these making sure that there's proper coordination, making sure that, for example, sino ba dapat ang magbayad ng primary care? Should it be your insurance company or should it be DOH? So, things like those, that's not um, decided upon yet. Uh, right. So, so, yun eh. So, clean I, up yeah. the system, make it, uh, design it better so that it's more efficient, more effective, and then at the same time, uh, make sure that sufficient resources are are allotted. So those are the two things. Na, nakakalimutan kasi yung structural reforms na kailangan eh. Right now, people think pera lang ang katapat. Right. Ano eh? Um, it's really pera and at the same time, reforms, structural reforms. So that that would ensure that that money is really, um, is, is best used. Well, I really hope that, you know, if there's something that we get out of this whole situation is a sense of urgency in those reforms that you had mentioned. 